Um, I'm supposed to interview the next two people. Introduce. No, no, no. Interview. Um, while they're on the stage. But instead, I'll just let them talk to you. Uh, so do you know Josh Corman? Where is he? Do you guys know Josh? Anyone? Not know him? He's the guy who uses all the fancy words to sound important. He has all sorts of history from what I read from his illustrious two-page bio. Um, works at Akamai, is, is some type of influencer based on whoever he paid off at this magazine. Um, Jericho, another loudmouth, weird, respected person. Uh, yep, that's it. <laughs> Opinionated person who's been around for quite a long time. And uh, these two fine gentlemen will be speaking about the future of Anonymous because we decided not to give you a how to protect against APT. We just wanted to give you a little bit more of how to get more APT in your life. Um, so I'm going to leave it up to them to do that. Thank you, boys. Thank you. Do you even have like a little mic? talk is basically about anonymous and looking forward we call it anonymous 2020 kind of a play on looking at it with a clear perspective as well as the next eight years or more uh, for most of you uh, is there anyone in here who is not familiar with anonymous in some capacity that's good liar okay we have one anonymous member down here <laughs> at least one yeah okay. is there anyone that is in anonymous and will actually say so How about any law enforcement? <laughs> okay, so um, Anonymous has been around in their current form somewhat for about four years. Um, the group is really based on a reactionary method. Uh, something happens, they don't like it, and they in turn react. Uh, it's an interesting model. Um, we're going to talk about that a little more. Anonymous isn't a classic group, it's a meta group or an ideology, kind of something that anyone can say, hey, I'm a member today or I'm not. It's both a weakness and the strength of their group. Uh, the purpose of this talk is to start dialogue because most of the people that are talking about Anonymous really aren't looking at it um, with any kind of, I don't know, deeper understanding, meaning, or looking at any solid history where they're going. Uh, a lot of what we say is our opinion. We're probably wrong about some of this. We welcome discussion and that's really the the main thing is that we want to get people talking about it uh, because Anonymous is pretty much here to stay in one form or another. Um, so we kind of covered who we are. The, the main takeaway here is that uh, between Josh and I, we are, we kind of balance each other out as far as our own work experience, our views. Um, we have pretty different backgrounds, uh, and really it does turn it into a very complimentary uh, presentation. We both see this as a sociology issue, not a technical issue, and that's one of the more important points that we want to make. Um, this is not something that you can throw a bunch of money and plug in some firewalls and boom, you're, you're done. This is something that we have to understand on the human level and moving forward, we have to understand it if we're going to adapt or overcome it. So, um, you know, often when I speak, I talk in terms of security of consequence, uh, whether I'm, you know, starting a jihad against the PCI Council saying, you know, PCI is a No Child Left Behind Act. It's because I think in terms of replaceability, we, talk, we sometimes talk about frequency and impact, but 
If you really think about it, the most replaceable things we have are credit card numbers. Nearly everybody in here has lost one. And at most it was 50 bucks in an inconvenience, and usually that's waived. And yet because of compliance or because of conventional wisdom or dogma, we, spend, we tend to spend all of our time on the most replaceable asset types. So I tend to rail against that and look at things that are harder to replace, like loss of intellectual property or whatnot. Um, so myopically, we focus at the opportunity cost of more important things. And one of the reasons I'm attracted to this topic, despite the risk it has proposed to people like Aaron Barr and others, is I think this is of consequence. I don't look at this as a vendor might look at it, or I don't look at this as a defender of an enterprise might look at this. I look at things like, you know, you can lose rights and freedoms in minutes that took hundreds of years to secure. Uh, and if we don't look at this as a larger topic and we don't humble ourselves to what this might mean later, uh, if we're always looking through how do I make a buck off of this or, or this doesn't affect my company, uh, you, you might miss the bigger picture. So we want to try to elevate this not to the technical lens, but to how might this impact the way you live and your kids and, and the way uh, your country looks or, or international things look later. <laughs> One of the other important things to remember and to uh, look at is why we care about this. And traditionally, a lot of the, the problems out there on the internet, they don't affect us. Or in the security, they do, but in different ways. With Anonymous, and one thing to remember is that we're using Anonymous really as an example uh, for this presentation, but it could be any group. It could be Anonymous, it could be a splinter group, it could be the next one that comes along, or a completely different idea but look at it in the bigger picture, and we begin to see that almost everyone is involved in one way or another. Whether you have the, the vigilantes that are involved, the good guys, you know, quotes around that because some of their uh, techniques are questionable. Law enforcement, anonymous themselves, analysts, and who's stuck in the middle is the civilians. How many times have we seen, um, like, LulzSec or Anonymous compromise a site and release 60,000 credit cards or, you know, all of the ops or the... Uh, BART data for the users of the website. Well, those are the people that are getting affected by this more than anyone. And when you're affected, you're involved. Traditionally, there's been clear lines of involvement. If you have a group, like Josh's Knitting Circle, you are either in the group or you're not. There's no gray area. But with Anonymous, there is. There's a huge gray area. Some people are involved. Some people are involved one day, but not the next, and, oh, hey, nope, I'm back in. And they go back and forth. Um, we also have to look at influence. Um, there's a lot of external influence on the group, not only from anonymous, but from former members, uh, prospective members, from analysts, from the media, from law enforcement. There's a lot of different people kind of pushing the group and really manipulating how they're moving forward, whether they know it or not. And this includes organized crime. This includes foreign nation states. Uh, there's, there's been quite a few false flag operations. It's becoming a perfect scapegoat. Um, for blaming anything on. So when we say anonymous is a meta group, one of the uh, better analogies uh, was Patrick Gray um, in a blog. He said that anonymous is like piracy. So in the 17th century, there was the pirate flag, and you had ships sail under it, and they did bad things. They plundered and uh, you know so forth, but they didn't know each other. Maybe some of them did. Maybe they talked in port every once in a while, or maybe it was word of mouth. So that's more how Anonymous operates today. It's not really a conventional group. Um, it's a meme, kind of an identity, ideology, all mixed into one. And piracy is a good historical example, but another one that I am recently started uh, using was uh, Christianity. So you have a religion that has a wide variety of people in it. You have good giving people that try to help their fellow citizens, and you also have Westboro Baptist. You have a real huge range. And so when we started talking about these points, Josh is like, oh, wait, you know, you don't want to go into Christianity. That's a heated topic. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Isn't Anonymous a heated topic these days? So um, this, this wasn't the beginning, um, but it was really a, a milestone for our conversation. Um, we spoke at DEF CON 19. Uh, it was the Whoever Fights Monsters panel. We were originally going to bring Aaron Barr to, to speak to the community on what he had done, why he had done it, and, and see what this meant for the security industry and the research community and the black hat community. Um, he got lawyered off the panel, um, and also another member backed out. He was afraid of retaliation from Anonymous. So uh, um, Paul Roberts and I approached Jericho and said, you know, you'd be a good, you've been researching this independently. But for us, we did a panel, and the whole panel's recorded, but 
we shared some thoughts, we wanted to start some conversation, and within minutes after leaving the panel and going to the Q&A room, we got in a, a fierce argument with active members of Anon. Um, it was excellent. It really showed us how bad our understanding was. So people who had been researching them for months, I mean, I don't know how many months before DEF CON, but the concept of building a better anonymous started in our prep for the panel. Uh, but what we found out is half the things we thought were the motivations weren't at all, or why a particular breach happened wasn't. So we got a really excellent conversation about how the media coverage is bad, um, how it's not a group, all the different splinters within the group, and it really led to fueling and improving our Building a Better Anonymous blog series. Do you have any comments on that, Rome? Um, yeah, the, the big one is the dialogue with Anonymous and law enforcement and the security community, mm -hmm. getting all the different perspectives. It was uh, kind of eye-opening that a lot of them are real common, and you think, well, you know, there's only certain ways you can look at this, but it really is a lot more expansive than that. And I should be clear that uh, the mask was a sign of good faith from an anonymous member, not to indicate that I am now or ever was a member. Um, so the, the concept of building a better anonymous um, was really the thrust, which might seem counterintuitive, the thrust of our blog series. So you have some notes here. So um, building a better, uh, we were talking about seeing the past and present. With anonymous being a household name, um, it's, like I said, it's become relevant to everyone, one way or another. Uh, anonymous, right now, they're enjoying a whole world of moral infighting. They disagree with themselves, with each other. There's been splinter groups, um, most familiar with LulzSec. That was a splinter off of Anonymous. They did their thing for 50 days. Uh, all kinds of other interesting stuff happened to them. They kind of folded back into Anonymous or said, hey, we're working with them. So there's this kind of you know, back and forth uh, that we need to look at. And that's just one example. You know, So within Anonymous, there's other splinter groups. And they don't necessarily have a catchy name or you know, a, a pirate logo or anything. So it's very hard to track these different movements within the group. Uh, apologies in advance to Anonymous, but they are full of what we call the lowest common denominator. The majority of their members really don't do much. They are glorified cheerleaders at best. There are a handful, and by handful I mean you know probably 5-10% of them, that are either skilled hackers, truly activists, or whatever. Um, but even with it being mostly the lowest common denominator, society and security were struggling to keep up. And really, when you think about it, if we can't deal with the worst that they have to offer, quite simply, we're fucked. And I use that word very carefully because if that word offends you, then you need to get out of the industry. Anonymous is going to be a rude awakening if you actually have to fight them at any point, whether it's through security, through the media, or anything else. Uh, like Josh said, building a better anonymous is counterintuitive. Um, so, show of hands, who wants to see a better anonymous? Okay, for those who didn't raise your hands, why not? Anonymous as they are is a crude, blunt weapon. They don't do a lot of good, they make a lot of noise. So, why don't you want a better anonymous that's more efficient, that gets stuff done, and most importantly has less collateral damage? So with that in mind, who wants a better anonymous? Yeah, a so more. a few more people. And hopefully in another day or a week or a month, more people will raise their hands to that. Well, l let me rephrase it. Who wants a worse anonymous? Oh, well. <laughs> Other than Chris, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Right. So looking at anonymous, uh, we want to propose a better one because one way or another they're going to evolve. They're going to get better and it may be slow, it may be better in one or two areas, not the rest. We'd rather say, look, here's kind of a framework of how anonymous could improve and once again, not just anonymous, the next group or anyone else. Yeah, we really chose the blueprint idea because whether by accident or design, what they've stumbled upon is a framework or a blueprint for power. Uh, this blueprint can be improved upon, right? So right now it's a very low barrier of entry, but also an upper bounds limit of how effective they can be. Uh, there's, there's inherent flaws that we get into in our series about uh, limitations that are the very nature of the way they organize or, or fail to organize. So look at this as a non-2.0, whether it's under a different name in five years and maybe has no current members in the new roster. Um, this is the idea of improving upon what they've discovered. 
So a lot of this is based on an article series that Josh and I are writing called Building a Better Anonymous. Um, the original idea was, oh, it's going to be one article, 2,000 words, tops. And we started talking. And by talking, I mean arguing, debating, yelling at each other. Uh, and with Anon. And with Anon, and like I said, all these other people. And all of a sudden, then it turned into, OK, we think we can do this in seven parts. And we got to number five and said, well, wait a minute. The actual article about building a better Anon that's not going to cut it in one. So now it's an eight-part series with five of them released. Has anybody read any of the series? Okay. Cool. Right. We, we encourage you to read it later if this topic interests you. Uh, we actually get into a lot of details about it. Um, if you're interested in sociology, great read. If you're looking for technical solutions, skip it. So we have an introduction, abstract. Um, we have what we call fact versus fiction. Um, there's a lot of assumptions about anonymous. There's a lot of incorrect statements. We try to clear, uh, clarify which ones are which. Um, how we got it all wrong, that's both the media and professionals. Especially the media. Especially the media, yeah. Um, how anonymous has failed in theory and practice, which we figured might draw a little ire from them. But uh, they actually, the anonymous members that spoke to us about it were pretty pleased with it. They said, yeah, you know, you guys got a lot of this right. Yeah, I think uh, Anani Ops tweeted, this is a bitter pill to swallow, but one we should all take. I, I think it was right after the LulzSec takedown as well. Right. Yeah. And after that is Building a Better Anonymous in Philosophy. That's number five that we just released. And that entire article is basically, uh, Josh came up with a framework, just a three-point plan, how to rebuild or to build a new type of anonymous group. Um, like we said, better, more efficient, less collateral damage. Number six, we'll go into the details, how to actually build a group and to overcome some of these uh, problems that they're facing. And then number seven will be some abstract ideas and a conclusion. Okay. Good. So um, I made a primer. I'm not going to show all of it here. But this was summarizing all the research we had done up until DEF CON 19 and some of the Im immediate insights we had from arguing with members uh, in the room for an hour. So. There's a longer version of this, but I'll give you the high points. The big takeaway, the biggest takeaway we had is that Anon is a, a, basically because the iconography is a bit of an Rorschachian plot, right? We see in it what we want to. We project. And most of the press narrative, most, there's a few exceptions in the room that did some good work, uh, most of it was really just saying what they wanted to see. Um, if it bleeds, it leads is something, a theme that comes up in a lot of our talks. So in a couple cases, there were more nuanced operations from Anon, uh, and no one covered it. So they had to crank up the volume to actually provoke media coverage. But this was a really big takeaway, because if you think they're freedom fighters, they are. And if you think they're hacktivists, they are. And if you think they're hoodlums, they are. And the truth is, there's lots of different structures and motivations. And we realized we were never going to really understand this group until we could understand the bias that we bring and we project into that iconography. The, the second big takeaway is there isn't a group. Hopefully most of you realize this by now, but it's stunning to me how many months after DEF CON people still look at this as a singular monolithic they. It is more of a composite. It is a group of groups with very different motives and reasons for participating, very different levels of allegiance. Uh, it's more of a brand in a franchise which is borrowed and often abused by anyone. Uh, since anyone can claim the name of Anonymous, it's essentially an unmanageable brand, and that's driven great frustration amongst some of the, the chaotic good moral uh, participants in the group who are trying to do something good and then someone tarnishes their reputation the next day. Um, maybe like you, I had some cognitive dissidents early on around out payback. I'm like, well, you know, are these guys good or are they evil? You know? Um, I can certainly get behind, you know, helping oppressed people in Tunisia like the in, in Egypt, you know, if you've looked up on telecomics how he helped supply back some internet connectivity, etc. But then I also saw really aggressive things where you're putting the wives and children of every police officer in Arizona at risk on a border state uh, to make a point, but actually exposing uh, risk to innocence. So I really couldn't tell, is it good versus evil? And then I turned into a good geek, and I dusted off my Dungeons and Dragons 3x3. Three three, and I realized that uh, it's not really good versus evil. Um, it's lawful versus chaotic, right? Those trending towards order or, or disorder. And really the defining characteristic was the chaotic nature. So there are chaotic good, like Robin Hood, right? And there are chaotic uh, evil as well. But you have a point you'd like to make on this slide. Yeah, really on the last one. But uh, one of the things that we need to look at is what we call in-game ethics. Right. The ends justify the means. We're all familiar with it. 
And um, I think it's real important because history, they say, is written by winners, but history is also the ultimate judge of what was right or wrong. So given our location, think about the Boston Tea Party. What if the Raiders had boarded the ships instead of wearing American Indian costumes and had Guy Fox masks? Would we consider that, hey, that was a good thing by Anonymous, or would we say, well, hey, no, you know, they, they were trespassing, destruction of property, blah, blah, blah. You know, so ultimately, you have to think, well, is it good, bad, or is it a combination of that leads ultimately to good, and is it worth getting to that? And uh, perhaps in a future post, we may actually try to map out, you know, where does LulzSec fit? Where does the jester fit? Where do you fit? Where does the FBI fit? Um, and how are things migrating over time? Um, and you know, just like there's a presence of some people trying to help promote freedom or anti-censorship or bring attention and watchdogs to things like PIPA and SOPA and ACTA, uh, there are also some uh, people that just want to see the world burn. Um, some of the more aggressive influence is fighting for the same brand uh, and attention um, and, and media hits, which is further distorting our narrative. Uh, if you like this artwork, Mar is amazing. She did a ton of custom artwork for us. Mar for the win. All right. Um, and there's a lot of sex, anonymous sex, lots and lots of anonymous sex, S-E-C-T-S. Um, <laughs> this is an incestuous family tree. Good, good to clarify that. Yeah, of course. Uh, this is an incestuous family tree over time. I think uh, Geek, uh, what was it? Uh, Geek, Geek Systems uh, did this post. It's not a perfectly accurate map, but it's pretty, it's pretty revealing as to how people will splinter off and come back in. But I want to draw your attention to the root of the family tree. It's 4chan. More specifically, it's B. And if you haven't been there, I don't know. If you haven't, saying. stay away. Yeah, stay away. Um, in fact, the movie tonight, if you come to We Are Legion at 6 o'clock, uh, really does an excellent job of showing the, the real DNA in the core of Anonymous in, in, in its roots. And it, I find it somewhat hilarious at times when we broadly refer to Anonymous as hacktivists. You know, loosely the intersection of activism and hacking. And yet, within the ranks, there are very, very few activists and very, very few hackers. I'm not saying they don't exist, um, but it's really sloppy to, to generalize this. Um, one of my bigger fears, again, since I care about security of consequence, is you know every time someone says APT gun kills a kitten. So, um, you know, I've been researching, and others have been researching, you know, adapt persistent adversaries or more sophisticated and determined threats. Right. My big concern, and this was punctuated by a government CISO, is. Anonymous is God's gift to China, or Russia, or... Russia, or, yeah. If it, you take this quote and you substitute anonymous in China, and you can put it just about any actors going back through history. In fact, one of the aha moments for me was I saw a series of anonymous, you know, in the name of anonymous and LulzSec operations, and I'm like, that one's not them. You could tell right away. It didn't fit their TTPs or their tactics, techniques, and procedures. It stuck out like a sore thumb. And upon talking about this, we're finding more and more cases where someone stole intellectual property, distracted people with a DDoS, said we are legion, and called it a day. So I'm actually much more concerned about the false flags and pretenders than I am about the actual people who identify with the meme. Um, I see Mark doctored this one up a little bit. Uh, so how do powerful, uninformed people react? Anybody remember the Red Scare and the age of McCarthyism? Right? I don't want to see cyber neo-McCarthyism. Thanks for that one. Um, but essentially, you know, anybody who can run a metasploit, are we going to now have to say I'm not now, nor have I ever been a member of Anonymous? Um, there's people broadly painting these groups with a terrorist brush. Uh, and given how many different motivations there are in the group, uh, this isn't going to bode well. You have a point? So one of the kind of splinters recently is Antisec, which is a movement that kind of sort of broke off from Anonymous. But it actually has uh, roots back to the early 2000 range. Um, the original anti-sec was a movement that basically said, screw full disclosure, we don't want to see anyone giving away vulnerability information for free. And that was the long and short of it. More recently, Anonymous or some members have kind of hijacked anti-sec and co-opted it to mean, okay, we're the anti-security. We're going to show security sucks all around as many companies as we can. And when I got to think about it, uh, I really see this more as something to be scared of, at least for our industry. So right now, Anonymous, they have a, a very diverse set of beliefs and goals. You know, everything from politics to freedom of speech, whatever. It's 
like I said, it's good, but what happens when anti-sex steps in, and what happens if enough of them motivate and work together and say, okay, we are going to systematically show that security across the internet is broken. Well, we've pretty much seen that. Most of us in the room are familiar with that. But what happens when the rest of the world starts to understand that? You know, the last time we saw uh, it was one of the certificate authorities get popped, everyone in security is like, oh, no, what do we do now? How are we going to handle this? Well, that was one CA. What happens when the trust in all of the security companies, all of the underlying infrastructure, all of it's at question. And think about that and then go into, uh, you know, nuclear power plants and all the fun stuff that we like to talk about or, uh, you know, think about as a scenario, what if. Mm -hmm. So I really see anti-sec more as an interesting and scary offshoot. Yeah, if you think about the motivation of most, for the most part, since between 2003 and now, most of you are making the assumption of a financially motivated, economically acting adversary. Uh, and in general, not just reserved to Andysec, you now have ideologically fueled ones. Some of these actually put up their own money to execute these campaigns. Uh, they do it in their free time. They do it as a second job. So when you're dealing with someone who isn't going to give up when it's too hard, or act in ways that conform to your expectations, it's a very different proposition. Things that we said someone wouldn't do may not apply to these guys. One of the uh, strong motivations for Anonymous is retaliation. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So we've seen with MasterCard, PayPal, Sony, these companies do something bad by Anonymous standards, and Anonymous says, okay, well, it's time to punish you. And that's either through compromise, defacement, denial of service, whatever, um, it ends up that retaliation is a very central, strong theme, uh, not only with their foundation and what we know about them, uh, but moving forward. So right now, like we said, uh, Anonymous is reactionary. You do bad, they're going to punish you. And we started thinking kind of out loud about, well, what happens when Anonymous starts actually using fear as the, a weapon and a tool? What if their new maxim is, okay, if you do wrong, we're going to punish you, and this time we're not going to just kind of, you know, ooh, shiny object and forget about you. We're actually going to stick with you until you do right. So we have a one-month campaign of denial of service. Big deal. What happens when that turns into a year or two? How many companies have dealt with that or are capable or want to? Oh, yeah. So Operation Payback was one example. That was when they actually put the name to the operation. Um, they covered several companies uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, well, some, mostly shutting off WikiLeaks. Yeah, yeah originally surrounding WikiLeaks, either the, the payments or uh, treatment of Julian Assange, whatever. So one of the other things that's interesting to watch, and this is certainly not new, is a belated justification. So sometimes anonymous, and like I said, this goes way, way back, um, even to early 2000 range when um, did a defacement mirror. We would see people deface websites, and then afterwards they'd be like, oh, I need to put up a clever message. What's my justification for popping this site? You know, it was just causality. It's like, no, oh, I'm a, a joy rider, but I want to look bigger, better, and more important. So some of the same things we're seeing now with anonymous. Oh, we're hacking this, we're going to denial of service, attack that, and now we'll come up with a reason. In fact, uh, Topiary, for example, was a, a, is a natural um, spin, uh, spin doctor or propagandist, right? Very uh, apt skills on being able to spin why this particular operation was done. So like I said, uh, retaliation, it plays a central theme. Um, and all of these screenshots are from a, uh, a table I tried to make that kind of cataloged the, the big events in Anonymous. And then I said, well, hey, let's try to track all of them. And that lasted all of about a week before I gave up. Uh, you would need a small staff to do that. But as you'll notice, uh, one of the columns that are colored is uh, retaliation. That's the central theme for why they're doing this. The question is, will companies or uh, politicians be influenced? Are they right now? So, show of hands, who in this room has ever done something out of fear or not done something out of fear of retaliation? Yeah, it's a common theme. So, once again, what happens when that becomes a primary tool in the anonymous arsenal? 
In fact, one of the reasons the coverage has been so bad is certain people were afraid to offend them and turn into the next Aaron Barr. And one of the things we had to contemplate was how far do we take this, and that's why we had to be very careful and deliberate in our, our, our own parameters and uh, operational parameters on how we were going to pursue this research and what we would and wouldn't do. Um, so fear is an element whether they intended it or not. So yeah, then the next question is uh, data on anonymous. Right now, we don't have data. We have rhetoric, hype, gossip, opinions, assumptions. Um, there's actually no real data on anonymous as a group. Numbers, their ops, what they're doing, or anything else about them. And the question is why? Companies are using anonymous as a selling point. Law enforcement is obviously after them, but they're not using any of the data to say, hey, we need more of a budget. And it's curious to me that they play such a central role in our lives right now, at least in the media and in the security realm, yet we don't know much about them. Uh, sorry, once I go back. Um, so odds are there are a few private companies that do have this data. There's probably a few people out there that are tracking it. And it would be curious to see it and to see how complete it is. Because the nature of Anonymous says that we can't have complete data on them ever. There are going to be people that are affiliated or temporarily affiliate. They will carry out an operation. They will attack someone. And they may or may not ever say, this was on behalf of Anonymous, or I think it is, or this is the justification. So once again, even in a perfect world, the most we could ever hope for is wildly incomplete data. The other curious point to me is what's really new about Anonymous? When you think about what they're doing, uh, the name Anonymous, it's been used before. Hacktivism, definitely not new. Denial of service, defacements. All of this is old. So the question is, why are we struggling to deal with them? Okay. 20 years in the industry and we can't really wrap our heads around a group that is using old techniques. So uh, I spent a lot of time trying to think about what does this mean to the enterprise. And I, I actually care more about what it means to our personal lives. But if you think about your role as a defender or as a vendor, one of the statements I made at RSA this year was, Anonymous held up a mirror to our neglect. There was nothing really sophisticated or difficult last year. These were pretty simple exploits. This is SQL injection, network DDoS, maybe a little phishing. There was nothing hard. What they really showed us is how insecure we are and how much of a farce some of this is. It really highlighted that we have very poorly operationalized basic web hygiene, for example. And that's just the current methodology. If they were to turn up the heat and introduce a little bit more skill and tool, it would be even worse. But pretty much they had their way with us for all of 2011, uh, showing us how badly we operationalized the basics. Um, Jericho does not like this, but I would like to, once and for all, I cannot believe how many security professionals still believe that you don't have to be faster than the bear, just faster than your buddy. There are far more bears, you're drenched in bacon fat, and you just poke that one in the eye. They, this particular adversary class, if you're looking at it like that, or even the, the, the kitten-killing APTs, they really don't go after the slowest one. They're going after you. And a lot of our, uh, the people who were dumbfounded when they found themselves in the crosshairs of a punishment campaign fundamentally misunderstood this. Um, something I do for other research is I try to map out all the different pantheon of adversaries. Uh, you'll get these slides if that's too much of an eye chart. But if you look at top, there's a whole bunch of different actor types. Below that is a whole different pantheon or spectrum of motivations. Below that is a different kind of impact it can have on your business. Below that is a how many, uh, which their preferred asset or target type is. And as you start to map these, these are one of the ways I was able to spot false anonymous operations, things that weren't them but were done in their name. So for example, if it's a hacktivist, let's ghost out everything else that doesn't apply. So it's primarily ideological or political in its, in its motivation, not financial. Uh, they tended to go after personal and reputational damage or maybe availability. And it wasn't to go after credit card numbers per se, although there were a few ops. It was primarily after web properties or your ability to conduct business. So when you can start to see the linkages between these, it, became, it becomes a little more obvious um, how they're going to operate, how they're going to engage, and therefore could inform your response or your actions. You know, when the Sony punishment campaign was happening, all the press kept saying, so when do you think this will stop, or what can they do to stop it? And I said, there's not a technical solution they can deploy 
against an ideological grievance. The original sin was the geo-hot stuff. And once you've pissed them off, they're going to continue to punish you until they're satisfied or bored. So uh, this, this just changes the way we frame our response. I also think there's a bit of broken windows theory, right? You know, if you understand the theory of broken windows, order invites more disorder. So maybe it was the first kid who threw the rock through the, the window at Sony, but there were 21 successive punishments in that campaign, not all done by the same ad actors, and not all done for the same reasons. Role playing, um, a lot of organizations, I know you haven't encountered some of them, but people who are genuinely concerned about this are starting to do crisis management tabletop exercises. They're saying, okay, what happens if we find ourselves on the wrong side of this? You know, should we update our policies so we don't sue third party researchers, perhaps? You know, are there some policy changes, some crisis management changes? Uh, what are the new actions to take in the face of this new kind of uh, a situation? Right. <clears throat> So, show of hands, in the war of anonymous versus law enforcement, who thinks anonymous is winning? And law enforcement? One. Just one. Interesting. So we have one Fed back there. <laughs> A bunch of non-voters, too. So, yeah, now you ask yourself, why? Why do you have that perception? What is it based on? Like I said, we don't really have data, so there's really one answer, and that's the media. You know about certain anonymous operations, and you know about certain uh, law enforcement bust or raids regarding anonymous. Um, how many of the busts do you read about and remember? Anyone take a guess? How about how many countries anonymous members have actually been busted in? And busted means either raided or charged, arrested and charged. Any guesses? Somebody guess. Higher? 14 that we know of. That's 14 where we actually have documents saying this happened. And that's probably a real low number. So when you think about it, you know, the numbers that started out were three, four. It's considerably higher. Go ahead. So back, uh, excuse me, looking at the anonymous activity, uh, if you look real carefully at the dates, this is really kind of a, a one day span with a little bit on each side of it. There's a lot more activity going on than people realize. And like I said, I started this chart just going off the media. You know, if there's an article about anonymous doing something, I added it. And then I said, oh, wait a minute. How about the ones that don't get reported? So follow the pound anonymous uh, hashtag on Twitter, and you will quickly start cutting yourself. <laughs> and the amount of activity is insane. And yeah, that's why I said it would take a, a small army to keep up with them. And you can't even go backwards because several of these delete their Right. We, we noticed that uh, we would go try to reference a tweet, and even weeks old it would be deleted. So one in three anonymous ops maybe make any news. Uh, maybe one in five make tech news sites. And maybe one in 30 make mainstream. So that's kind of, those are just guess numbers, but that's really kind of the influence that you're getting. And then on the other hand, we have the law enforcement activity, so the same kind of chart. And if you look closely at the dates there, that's really just showing 2012. Uh, to date, we know of 184 arrests and 106 raids. That's probably considerably higher than most of you realize or thought about. And there's probably a lot more to add. Uh, just based on that chart that you're looking at, we know of one more incident that I just didn't have time to get to. And if we go digging through PACER or something, we can probably find a lot more. So one of the points to look at here is that, is law enforcement winning? Well, they're making some progress, but the one thing they're doing wrong is failing at the press. They're not really showing the message that, yeah, we're on top of this, we're making a lot of bust, we're making some headway. But the counterpoint to that is that it's not about the numbers. It's not, oh, we busted 500 anonymous. You have to go for the figureheads. Even though Anonymous says, hey, we're a leaderless organization, they do have leaders. And it's not intentional, it's just some of them have a stronger voice, more people listen to them. So, for example, Commander X was recently busted, apparently. Um, going for him, we all know uh, Lulsec and Sabu. That was a, a big one. So, you know, that was definitely taking out Lulsec. But once again, on the other hand, Anonymous is now fond of saying, Lulsec busted, hacking down 0%. And whether you call these leaders or not, um, the, the, what's clear is certain ones have asymmetric clout. Right. So uh, we should go a little quicker. But, um, so if you want to see what Anonymous looks like, those are uh, some of the publicity shots and mug shots and such. Uh, notice the star because some are alleged. 
Yeah, some are alleged, some of them have pled out, some of them are cooperating witnesses. So now, that still leaves almost 270 more that have, that have been busted that are related to anonymous or LULSEC and those activities. And it's just an interesting number. Like I said, 184 arrests, 106 raids, over 14 countries. And not even including, because we couldn't get to them all, things like the Commander X one. And right. Who's prominently featured tonight in the, uh, the film. So, real quick, the uh, one point there is that this is truly an international movement. There's no denying it. And the other important thing to look at is that uh, with 270 up there, does that begin to give us an idea of how many people are involved in Anonymous? Can we start to extrapolate or even, you know, guess? So uh, the net result, um, there is growing frustration. It is getting harder. And for the, the, the personalities of the most clout and the longest standing presence in the Twitterverse, for example, uh, this is becoming frustrating. Um, there's a great line in the film uh, that says, well, guys, they said, no, stop get ruining our bad name. Um, so there's always been a schism between those trying to have fun and those using this as a platform for change post uh, chronology. Uh, but now it's even worse because some of the, 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 the truly good things a couple of these guys are trying to do is, is tainted and, and distracted by some of the more aggressive things. So at least in the, in the nons that have been engaging with us via comments in Twitter or email feedback on our blog series, Many of them see themselves as a, at a bit of a crossroads, not because of the little secret arrest. I think this was brewing for, for some time. So part four really of our series really tried to show some of the obvious inherent challenges in the current approach and structure. And part five tries to offer up something not judgmental, but as a straw man for debate. Uh, here's a really simple way that you could reapproach the problem. And some of them hate it. We've gotten some pretty angry feedback of you completely don't understand anonymous. So with part five, what we're really trying to say is, again, uh, this might be something that takes place in 10 years. It might not have any of the current members in it. It might have a different name. But if someone were to take the blueprint and who has grown frustrated with the upper bounds limitations of what they're able to do, uh, this is something they could follow. Oh, wait, there's a comical one from Mar. So uh, yes, in fact, we might want to make some of them stronger, right? Uh, this was originally the building a better anonymous, but it's a little too dark in uh, Frankenstein's monsterish. But we have to show her amazing artwork. Um, so, one of the really, really simple ideas, uh, recognitions that we had, and this could be dead wrong, but let's just follow this for a second. If you separate the anonymous identity or the meme from its organizational structure, there could be a really broad, low barrier of entry where anybody can join or identify with the movement. Anybody. And what's happened is when people get tired of it, they leave. One of the more prominent and public departures was Sparky Blaze leaving. So some people just give up and leave, right? Um, and what we're saying here is if, in fact, you find that you simply can't maintain the brand, you're, you're chasing too many rabbits and catching none, we see that some or groups could rise and specialize with a more specific charter, do fewer things better. So some of these guys who really, really felt purpose in helping to uh, the oppressed people in Tunisia and Egypt, or who have found themselves to be almost a watchdog for things like telling the public about SOPA and PIPA and ACTA and what's the new one, CISPA, which sounds a lot like CISP. Uh, could they, in fact, make a smaller group that could splinter? Uh, maybe there's an, another one for um, moral outrage. This could be the folks that really wanted to take down child, child exploitation sites. Uh, this could be people who wanted to out uh, hate groups, like one of the operations early on uh, with Anonymous was taking down a, a KKK-based radio personality. Uh, there could be another chaotic good that's, that's doing the legislation work watchdog that you might see Anani Ops doing. If you really follow the personalities, different characters have different focus groups already, and this is happening. So one of the best pieces of feedback we got from this is, this is our way forward, part five. They, some of them really love this. Some of them really, really hated this and said, you're going to ruin our fun, right? The opposite is also true, right? Um, we don't know much about Malsec. Malsec got announced last Thursday. Uh, Malsec says we're going to be, or two, two, two weeks ago? I don't know. I'll lose track of time. Um, I'm not sure they're going to be aggressive or not, but they certainly want to turn up the heat in 2012. They want to have more impact. That might be better choices, more deliberate, less chasing fewer rabbits. But And one of the important things, and they actually... Um released their video announcing themselves the uh, literally hours before our article. Right. But one important part that they figured out is they stated their beliefs and their goals. Right. They outlined, this is who we are, this is what we're going to do. 
And moving forward, if anyone tries to say, well, I'm Malsec, and go off and do a false flag operation, it'll be quick for them to say, nope, that's not us. Yeah, they, was, they didn't go yeah. by our charter. It was scary timing, because they were basically acting upon several of our suggestions that we hadn't even made yet. Um, and then, you know, if you think this is BS, LulzSec kind of did this, right? They kind of did this already. All right. All right, so the basic, I, we had three levels to this. I'm just going to do it very, very, very quickly. Level one is going to sound completely counter to what you think of Anonymous, which is, you know, my favorite mentor told me, if you believe something, you should write it down. The more important the belief, the more clearly it should be articulated. So when we asked several of these guys, what does Anonymous stand for, we got very inconsistent answers even from the same folks. So in these kind of conversations, when they refined it down, they could come up with the three things they really care about, or the one thing they really care about, or why they participate as an individual. So part of this is writing down your beliefs. This attracts like-minded folks. It also anti-attracts people who don't want to do what you're doing. Uh, it's a little more specialized, but potentially more impactful. The second one was a code of conduct. Whether this is the pirate code, really more a set of guidelines, right? Or uh, honor among thieves, or whatever, what have you. You know, uh, I know CDC, for example, in the hacktivism, they had their, you know, we won't use DDoS or, or uh, defacement. That was part of their, um, their code of how they were going to execute uh, their goals. Uh, this also helps narrow the operational parameters of someone trying to abuse your brand, right? So this could be one through N. We also talked about unlocking, unlocking your inner badass, right? So anybody can shoot wildly into a crowd, but a sniper is one shot, one kill. So less failed operations do fewer ones better. Um, you know, anybody can lob Molotov cocktails, but it, you know, a controlled burn takes really specific timing and really specific placement. Um, you know, uh, what was the the Bushido code? Um, you know, when you're first learning sword play, you can hack wildly and inefficiently, but you know, a real master almost never takes out their sword, and when they do, it's a death blow. So the idea of being more effective and efficient because you're not getting distracted by the latest shiny object. So the, this, we're not going to repeat the entire blog post here, but this has really gotten a lot of discussion and points uh, across. And another important one, which I think the people at DEF CON really revealed, is the court of public opinion matters, and that includes the media coverage. So if there isn't an explicit... Um, I'm not saying, we, we specifically say you shouldn't let the court of public opinion drive you, but you need to be aware of it and investing time in the narrative being accurate or at least serving your purposes. You can almost picture this like a stock ticker or a presidential favorability rating, but you could easily plot out, even during the week when they did the uh, elective blackout, very high level of support for Anon in the peaceful protest, get the message out ruined two days later when a couple people did some more aggressive acts. So you can watch how people did or didn't support uh, Anon over time, and this is something we think a more potent instantiation would, would invest in and pay attention to. A um, couple points on vigilantism real fast. Um, you know, some argue vigilantism is never right, and it doesn't work. If you're not familiar with OpDarkNet, for example, um, this was an attempt to take down child exploitation sites. Uh, there's a little wrinkle, though, because even though most people morally can get behind that kind of a takedown and operation, uh, the chain of evidence is contaminated. You know, n none of that will be used to successfully prosecute anybody. Whereas you have people like the Jester or even uh, Cryptia. You want to make that point? Okay. With these guys, you know, Cryptia has written extensively about this. That you know, what you could have done is all the reconnaissance, gathered a case, put it in a box in a nice little bow, handed it to law enforcement and maybe excel, you know, achieve the end without um, maybe ruining the spoils. So I'm not necessarily trying to craft a better way to be a vigilante. Uh, we just know they're doing it, and right now it's not always working. So one of the other fun things to look at is predictions about Anonymous. Um, I actually want to do a, an entire article on this, go back historically through the media and see what people have been saying and which ones came true. Um, the quote up there, I'll let you read it real quick. So basically, LulzSec gets busted, and you know, LulzSec's out of commission. Uh, this guy from Panda Security says, well, Anon, they're screwed. You know, all they can do is denial of service attacks. One hour later, Panda, uh, yeah, pandasecurity.com got defaced yeah. by Anonymous. Yeah. You know, so one of the other ones is uh, McAfee Labs. They're predicting the true Anonymous hacking group, whatever that means, uh, will either reinvent itself or die out while others <laughs> are predicting, oh, sorry, reinvent itself or die out completely. Well, that's kind of what we've been saying, and they've been kind of doing that all along, so why is 2012 a special year that they're going to do the same thing they did last year, yeah. except for not die out? Yeah. Okay, so we'll go quickly through some of our forward thinking. Yeah. So. 
So anonymous as an industry, this is kind of another interesting uh, topic that when you think about all of the, uh, the money involved, so you have the media, mainstream, um, you have security companies, uh, anti-denial of service companies, law enforcement, correction facilities, prosecutors, defense attorneys, uh, police overtime for Occupy Wall Street, and anonymous was kind of related to that. You could argue that anonymous is kind of creating jobs. <laughs> Uh, there's definitely a lot of money as an industry behind them. Another interesting uh, point is what is cyber war? We're all tired of the hype behind that. Drink. Yeah. So uh, cyber war, I argue, is anonymous. It is the ultimate guerrilla warfare, multinational, tenacious, and when you think about it, uh, unpredictable at times, predictable for some of their ops, uh, yeah, that's really it. They are cyber war by many standards. And um, I, I think one of the disconnects is that so many people try to uh, compare war, conventional war, with cyber war. And that analogy falls on its face very quickly. So think outside the box, and I think this is it. Okay. So I'm not going to. We recently, uh, I've been working for a couple months on a Vanity Fair article. It's not exactly the readership in the room, um, but I find it interesting that a mainstream magazine wants to talk about this. So at first, I thought it was a sensational title. It's called World War 3.0. But essentially, I'm going to frame the argument for you. Um, there's a growing concern that there's a tension before the internet uh, between the forces of control and chaos, right? And in that continuum, it's actually escalating. So when you have a group like uh, the SOPA PIPA ACTA stuff, it enrages the chaotic actors, which provides ammo for more tight and stringent controls and fear to start regulating internet access. And I don't know much about it yet, but this fall, the ITU is going to start regulating and tariffing and splitting up the internet, or they're going to at least try to. So this free and open internet we've all been enjoying uh, is at risk, and things might escalate very, very quickly, almost like a feedback loop. There you go didn't work, All right? So it's a bit of a trap, right? It's almost like Chinese finger cuffs, right? The, the harder each side pulls, the more they're fueling the other. There, there's a great Commander X quote on Twitter that says, given the choice between tyranny and chaos, I'll choose chaos. And, and we wrote back and said, doesn't one fuel the other? Uh, and this is a pretty dangerous uh, escalation path. Um, but, you know, give it a read. It's something that's accessible to other people. Really tiny historical point, but potentially a really important one. Um, the day I first realized what Anon was, and it, it gripped me, and I said, you know, I have to look at this. Um, it reminded me of my Western Civ class in high school, right? In, in uh, 1914, Archduke Fer Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by a group nobody really understood called the Black Hand. And it is largely hailed as the trigger for World War I. Now, did one little group making one little assassination really have the oomph to cause that? No. But if you think about the time period, there was instability. There were alliances on top of alliances. It was a powder keg drenched in gasoline. And this was the match. And one of the reasons I feel compelled, and we've spent so much of our personal time on this, is we want to make sure that Anonymous isn't our black hand moment. Do I think they're going to assassinate someone? No. But could one operation, one uh, scandal reveal trigger something pretty bad? Uh, it feels like it could. So I want us to be ready and deliberate as a community and not just think about this as vendors or defenders but people with this kind of skill who might need to get involved. Um, there's this line I said, if you think that they wouldn't do this, uh, remember, um, there is no centralized leadership or roster. It doesn't matter what most of them would do. It only matters what one of them would do. So back to Anonymous 2020 and uh, convenient year. Has anyone thought about Anonymous the political party? If not, why not? So think about the pirate party. How did they get started? File sharing website, illegal file sharing. Three years later, they're a legitimate political party. So think about Anonymous. If they kind of rebrand, they let some of the negative attention die down, and they really go to a grassroots movement, it could happen, right? And so the future of Anonymous, the next three years, five, 10, 50? When we face this better anonymous, are we really going to be prepared? Excuse me? Okay. Okay. So uh, 
we're not going to solve this. We just want to ask really good questions. And what we've been most pleased about with the series, with the talks, with the blog stuff, is that we have gotten people talking. And the act of talking has made the content better. And there are active conversations within POCs of these guys where we feel at least two, we can see at least two different pockets ready to form their own little splinter group and, and graduate from the general population melting pot still holding on to the identity meme, but maybe intensifying their impact a little more focus. So this is going to continue to change, and if you haven't looked into the abyss here or figured out what this means for you yet, you know, we, we hopefully have given you a, a little bit of a framework to which to understand this. And as you go to each of these excellent talks for the next two days, um, you know, try to think of this, what's the impact of this particular piece of research in the context of how this unfolds. We want to thank Mar for her amazing artwork. We got a lot of review from Anonymous. Uh, pun, play on words, and also um, unnamed uh, contributors. Thank you. Right here, we have uh, advanced screening of the uh, Brian Napperberger We Are Legion film, which is amazing.